started here. Uh, if you didn't hear me before, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Shana Hogan. I am the Parks Program Coordinator for Parks and Trails New York. And on behalf of the entire PTNY team, I want to thank you for joining us for the third webinar in a new series designed to support grassroots friends groups. Uh, PTNY is really excited to continue this initiative with tonight's workshop on engaging with your park community. We know there's a lot of value in highlighting the exemplary work being done across the state and creating opportunities for friends groups to learn and engage with each other. Our goal through this series is to help you gain insight and inspiration and also feel motivated by one another. So tonight's workshop is going to be split into three parts. If you were here for our last week's workshop on fundraising and membership, this is going to look very familiar. If you were not, um, this is the agenda we're planning. Uh, first will be brief five minute presentations from our three featured panelists. Uh, they will share a few successful strategies they've found to cultivate productive and positive relationships with park management, local elected officials, volunteer groups, and also community organizations. So we are really looking forward to hearing from Joshua Marnell, uh, president of Fillmore Glen in the Finger Lakes. Uh, we have Carl Schoenthal, director and trail town chair of the Friends of the Genesee Valley Greenway which if you don't know is a multi-use trail touching 16 towns in five counties. Uh, and then we have Matthew Elliott, the board president of the Minna Anthony Common Nature Center at Willesley Island State Park in the Thousand Islands region. So after those brief presentations, we'll transition over to a 20 minute curated discussion uh, with the panelists led by PTNY's own Will Cote, our parks program director. The goal here with this conversation is to really drill down into the specific methods, techniques, and best practices that our panelists employed to successfully engage their park communities. Finally, after that, we'll allocate the remainder of our time, approximately 20 minutes, to provide you, the attendees, an opportunity to ask Josh, Carl, Matthew, and Will specific questions you might have. So our goal for tonight is really to act as a workshop. We want this event to be for everyone. So we wanna hear from you, to learn together, share best practices, and collaborate. So we welcome you to also share something you may have encountered or learned in your own efforts along the way. So before we begin, I really wanna review a few simple housekeeping points. First, I ask that all participants keep themselves muted. We wanna reduce the background noise and foster an enjoyable experience for everyone. So if you can't unmute yourself this time, don't be alarmed. Um, perhaps most importantly, I really encourage you to pose any questions you have this afternoon by adding them to the chat, or you can send them directly to me through the chat. We can address them later during the Q&A portion of the program, which is after all why we are here. So if you don't know where the chat feature is, it's on the bottom bar of your screen in the center. Additionally, if you experience any technical difficulties, please address those in the chat. We will be monitoring it so we can help you. Uh, and if you can't access the chat at all, please contact Lyndon Horvath. Her info is on your screen or it's on the PTN website in case you get kicked off the webinar. So to get the conversation going, we welcome you to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name, group affiliation, and I really encourage you to share something you're looking forward to next year, to achieving next year, uh, like a 2021 goal. I know we're all looking to get out of 2020, but what are we looking for here? So. So right now we do have the webinar set to speaker view, uh, which as you can see the panelist and the presenter at one time without the distraction of everybody else. If you want to change that, we recommend keeping it this way until we switch over to the curated discussion. But if you wanna change that, it's in the top right corner of the webinar, you can click view and you can change it there. So of course, I would like to acknowledge the creative and dedicated PTNY team who has developed this afternoon's program. Uh, Will Cote, Lyndon Horvath, and of course, our executive director, Robin Drobkin. I would especially like to thank our Arthur Savage intern, Erica Schneider, who has had an integral role in organizing tonight's program. And on behalf of Team PTNY, I want to remind you, as always, to stay involved with us. Uh, you are welcome to connect with us at any time. I know me and Will say this at every event, but we're really excited to hear from friends groups about any of your thoughts, updates, and questions. So although this is the last session in this particular webinar series, we do encourage you to keep an eye out for future programming from us. Um, it's potential series on advocacy coming in February leading up to Park Advocacy Day. I also have the honor of sharing some very exciting news with you all that is hot off the presses. You may have heard the news during last week's webinar, 
but PTNY has been approved to release the applications for the sixth round of the Park and Show Partnership Grant in mid-January. While it is important to remember that the program is always subject to available state funding and approval of the EPF by the State Budget Office, we feel confident we will be able to share more concrete details with you in the coming weeks. So keep your eyes peeled and most importantly, start thinking about projects, activities, and events you may want to submit for funding. And be sure to review your agreements with state parks and DEC to ensure you are eligible. For us at PTNY, releasing this application info is a great way to start off the new year and hopefully it's a sign of things to come for 2021. So fingers crossed. Uh, and with that, let's get to the main event. The PTNY is looking forward to learning from tonight's panelists and the curated conversation as much as we hope you are. Uh, so to that end, we strongly encourage you again to ask any clarifying questions, and really drill down into those insights we're hoping to gain from this conversation, especially for friends groups that are driven entirely by volunteers and may not have the backing of a larger, more robust organization. There are always new things to learn and be inspired by. So with that, Will, I will turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Shana. Uh, appreciate that. Um, really excited to, to have this conversation with our featured panelists. Um, I think it was, it was a great experience to try to identify tonight's panelists because each of these friends groups is bringing something unique and different to the conversation tonight. They all have a unique experience engaging with their broader park community. Um, as we mentioned, we're going to talk with Joshua, Carl, and Matt, um, who should have some specific insights. So let's cut right to it. Um, I would like to, uh, to introduce Josh, uh, Joshua, excuse me, from the Friends of Fillmore Glen, um, who has a particular deep series of connections with his park community and the town in which it's located. So Josh, take, us, take it away. Tell us a little bit about um, some of those two or three best practices that you have um, working in this aspect of uh, Friends Groups. Sure. Um, you know, one of the best ways we found to engage our community is um, making sure you're visible and also heard at the same time. Um, it is important to uh, work together with other non-for-profits in the area. Um, for example, at Fillmore Days, uh, we gave any non-for-profit a free vending space um, to do whatever they want. They could have a little fundraiser, a little raffle, or just make themselves known to the community. Um, also, um, let's say for Fillmore days, we made posters and uh, they were a circus style poster and we hung them all around town. Uh, we literally put them in every business on Main Street, uh, right in the front window. So anybody walking by would see that poster and they would recognize it because they've seen so many of them that it was an easy recognizable image. Um, after that, we took a, a screenshot of those posters and uh, we put, shared them to our Facebook page um, social media is a great way to interact with your community as well as communities in the surrounding areas. Um, within just a day, we, we received over a thousand views. I mean, that, it's just amazing at how quickly it can spread there. Um, another good method is to share your event with your friends and family because, hey, they may not have the same friends you have. And, uh, you know, it just takes very little work just a few minutes worth of effort and uh, you know you push that share button and then thousands of people can view it. Um, we also advertise in our local newspapers and uh, the surrounding cities around us newspapers. Um, that was quite helpful. It helps you reach a broad range of demographics with uh, the least amount of work <laughs> and the least amount of cost. Um, and also after we held our event, uh, we made sure we sent a big thank you out. Uh, that's probably one of the most important things is to acknowledge the time and money or any contribution that your donors have given you because they took their valuable time and used it for you. Um, so we made sure we sent them Christmas cards. We also sent them thank you emails. Um, we thanked them in the newspaper as well. Um, I think that goes you know, a really, really long way is to show your appreciation uh, for them. Um, and then, you know, everybody just said bathtub races. What's that all about? We want to go see it. So <laughs> that helped out too, is having a unique event. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, volunteers, you know, we all have a hard time getting volunteers together. Um, but volunteers are, uh, you know, they're the key. They're, they're essential to everything. Um, we kept a spreadsheet of all our volunteers 
as well as our media contacts for quick and easy access. So anytime we have an event that we need, we can send them out an email. Um, we made a little uh, kind of like a questionnaire on, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Um, what do you enjoy doing? Um, and that really helps us send the emails to the specific types of work that they're looking for. Um, and then we also thank our volunteers too. Uh, you know, we'll send them a card or an email. Um, I have a saying that says, if you feed them, they will come. So that's what we do at Island My Park Day. We feed them and boy, do they come. <laughs> um, but yeah, just making yourself out there and, uh, you know, visually seen as well as heard is, is a big thing there. And if you keep a common image, like our circus poster across many platforms, then it'll be easy for them to remember as well as easy for them to, you know, pick up and know what it's all about. Great. Um, thank you, Josh. I, I appreciate it. Um, there's already a couple of questions that I have that I want to get into, but uh, I will save them. That is the point of tonight's uh, conversation. So um, again, thank you for being the first to share a couple of thoughts. Um, I wanted like to switch over if we can to Carl. Um, Carl, you know, you're from the Genesee Valley Greenway. And I think one of the unique things about your particular friends groups is just essentially the, the sheer size and scope of it. Um, and particularly how you've navigated so many different types of relationships with local towns and villages, different state parks, regions, uh, and just the geography of, of the space that you and your, and your uh, colleagues at the Friends Group champion. So tell us a little bit about some of the two or three, you know, best practices that you found in engaging with the various communities. Thank you, and it's a pleasure being here. Um, I, I feel like our group uh, is interesting. It's, it's a volunteer-based group. Uh, we spread, as, as we mentioned, there are five counties, 16 townships. Uh, and I attended a public hearing uh, a few years ago on some future improvements that were being proposed in a grant that had been received uh, through state parks in partnership with some other organizations to do some improvements on the trail. Uh, up to that point, the Greenway was kind of a sleepy little uh, trail that would went through the community, but um, didn't really know much about it. Uh, participated as a, as a member of the Friends years ago, but uh, felt uh, it was important to get re-engaged and find out what the future was for, for the uh, facilities and uh, quickly realized that, that there's, there's a lot of connectedness between the trail and all the communities along uh, the Greenway. Uh, the first slide, uh, we recently completed uh, through state parks, uh, 10 miles of improvements uh, within the town of Wheatland, Monroe County, a town of Caledonia, Livingston County. Uh, and, and this project uh, brought, to, brought to us an opportunity to really showcase there hadn't been this kind of improvement done to the park uh, in, in years. Uh, this is the, the reuse of some canal uh, era uh, stones and some, some wood uh, panels and some new fencing. And, and this is a rest area that hadn't, prior to this, the trail was basically uh, a lot of green uh, old railroad bed. And through this project, um, we recognized that a lot of the community wasn't really aware of what was going on in the trail. And so part of the trail was closed for a period of time and we had to do a lot of communication. So the park manager uh, who covers the entire region, uh, we have I believe, uh, you know, through the five counties, uh, there's quite a bit of, of reach that needs to be done to communicate what's going on with the facilities. So uh, the use of Facebook, the use of videos, uh, Facebook streaming, streaming live, uh, uh, we're all a strategy towards that. Uh, one of the things that uh, we also do, and on the next slide you'll see, is that uh, our president, Joan Shoemaker here, is, is hosting a, a hike. And we do these, uh, we've done these uh, throughout the years, and even this year with, with COVID, uh, this was a hike that was done in coordination with the Nunday Historical Society. So uh, 30 miles south of here, I'm in, I'm in the Rochester area, but 30 miles south of here is an opportunity to get into uh, the local community and understand the history. The, the reason why the Greenway exists is because it was an old railroad corridor that before that was an old canal corridor that connected to the Erie Canal. And so the history of this uh, this transportation and now recreation facility goes back into the you know, mid 1800s. Uh, and a lot of the communities that, are, that, that exist along the trail are there because of the canal and the history of, of, of that being developed at that time. Uh, and so the reason the communities are there and the tie to the history is really important for us. And so highlighting that and doing the events around uh, trail revitalization uh, trail improvements, volunteering, such as the first day hikes and the hike that uh, Joan hosted here. 
uh, I Love My Park Day uh, was an opportunity to tie into volunteer organizations that are looking to do cleanup work. And we've done uh, a number of those now. And, and you know, one, we pick an area and then we'd go north and south along the trail a couple miles. Uh, and and it, in a canal uh, and railroad uh, corridor, uh, there's years and years of of dumping that has occurred. Uh, and so getting out in there and digging out the, the tires from the 1920s and the pianos and all the things that are buried along the trail uh, was very interesting as well. Uh, and then the next slide is, is something that we initiated a couple of years ago and is happy to be a part of this. As you can see, the five county region that we cover uh, is that we really were, were passionate about trying to make this connection between the trail and we recognize that the outdoor recreation economy is something that is that is really growing and is something that was was really sought after. And we especially saw that this year with COVID, uh, where to go and what to do uh, within the region. We couldn't really travel very far. Uh, and most people that use the Greenway, uh, and this is a corridor, you see the Genesee River here on this map, but the Greenway parallels the Genesee River essentially from Lake Ontario all the way down to uh, Cuba, New York, which is in Allegheny County and further on, uh, to the west, uh, to Hinsdale and Olean, and, and there's other, uh, other trails that connect to the greenways. The greenway provides this beautiful spine, but there are a lot of gaps in the trail, a lot of infrastructure needs throughout the entire system. Uh, we looked at 10 miles that was reconstructed, but uh, this is a 90, it's almost a 100 mile trail uh, that, that all has uh, certain needs. But the biggest need we saw was that each community along the trail, while it was formed over 150 years ago, uh, was, built, was built there because of the economic opportunities that that canal and the railroad provided. And we're looking to transition this now to a current, you know, 20, the 2020s uh, are going to be an opportunity for us to promote the outdoor recreational economy. So we're going out and we've actually signed up already almost 10 communities that will be participating in a USDA grant funded program to evaluate the assets in a community, uh, understand what the connections are to the trail, uh, look for improvements within that corridor, uh, business support, and outreach into the different communities and programming. Uh, and we call this the Genesee Valley Trail Town Program. Uh, and so through that funding source and through the opportunity and the economic uh, value that we see, a lot of these small communities that otherwise have really, uh, they really don't have a lot of, of opportunity for drawing tourism, but because they have a very rural and very, uh, very um, op uh, recreationally focused uh, uh, experience that you could find. Letchworth Park is right in the center of this. Allegheny Park to the south. Uh, you've got Lake Ontario to the north. So uh, taking a, a route from the north through the south, using your bicycle, hiking, snowmobiling as well, um, all seasons, uh, and multi-use. So equestrian users, uh, there, there's really a lot of opportunity to, to tie the trail into the communities. And so that's the program that we've initiated and we're underway with. That's it's like an awesome project, a lot to do though, obviously. Um, I also have a lot of follow-up questions, Carl. I'm, I'm doing my best to save them though, although um, the PTNY staff here knows I'm about to jump out of my skin with all the questions I have. Um, just as also a reminder too, for all of our participants out there, hopefully you have some questions as well. So again, feel free to add them to the chat or um, if you're more comfortable, you can uh, send them directly to Shana who will be uh, collecting them all for us as we, as we move into the last section of the agenda here. Um, and so without further ado, I just want to move on to um, our last featured panelist, um, Matt uh, from the Nature Center, um, up in the extreme north, if you will. Um, you know, your friends group has, a, a, again, a very unique relationship engaging with state parks. Um, so you know, tell us a little bit about that um, and some of the, you know, these best practices that you've identified in working with uh, your park community in a larger sense. Sounds good, thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Matt Elliott with the Friends of the Nature Center. We support the Mid Anthony Common Nature Center. You can see it's just above the logo in the bottom right hand corner uh, in Wellesley Island State Park along the St. Lawrence River um, with over nine miles of trails and over 40,000 year round visitors. Our mission is to support environmental programming that fosters conservation of local ecosystems, encourage uh, environmental uh, re recreation, encourage recreation uh, and inspire visitors to develop an increased respect for the natural world. Uh, next slide. And so if you look at the people that we're working for, it, these three pictures sort of sum that up. The first is our campers. 
So we are year, year round and our cabins are currently full right now uh, throughout the weekends. But primarily we're, we're facilitating a, the transient camper group that comes to the state parks uh, in the one, first picture. Second picture would be our local population. Uh, there's two small towns in our area and then uh, just south of us is Watertown, which is a small city. And we do a lot of things with the locals like school field trips. And the third picture is uh, because of our location, we have a, a summer uh, recreation group. So we have uh, cottage owners and people who come in the spring and leave in the fall. And we really try to facilitate these three different groups. And, and we have a number of different programs that do that. Um, you know, how, the question we were asked is how to maintain a working relationship with the parks and communication is key. So over communicating is important. Uh, we have structured monthly board meetings with both board members and park staff, which give us a consistent opportunity to follow up, hopefully, usually in person, although lately we've added uh, Zoom meetings and we've been getting through this pandemic with that. Uh, email, you know, you, ha you have, everyone has these things. Email is important. I, it, people are different, different skill levels with email. Some people check it once a week, especially our retired volunteers and then some people are, are pretty on the ball so the best thing for me is always face-to-face -face meetings or open phone calls where you can have a conversation uh next slide uh but what's really probably unique about us um uh, to will's point is we, we work very closely with the state park so the friends has its own employees and the state park has their own employees and we're all there to support each other in a common way and so the, the parks has two year round full time employees. They also have seasonal workers who come in in the spring and leave in the fall, college students, high school kids. We have interns. The friends uh, actually support through uh, our donations, an employee that's an NHT employee, uh, National Heritage Trust that we actually fully commit to a full seasonal, full year round employee there. And then we have our bookkeeper as well. So it's unique because, and, and a lot of, other charities that we work with don't always understand how we work because they're usually the board of directors runs all of the employees. They're in charge of everything. But for us, we really have to, to continually partner and work together on everything. So um, our organizational structure is key. And I don't you know, want to get too nerdy. Will, I know you're going to appreciate this. But um, you know, we look, have a real organic versus top-down structure. So my background is in business, but I'm not necessarily an expert on uh, nature and edu uh, natural education. Um, but we have people on the board who are, uh, you know, and we have the parks employees who are. So what we've tried to do is come up with a committee system that builds upon everybody's strengths. So we're very lucky because we have very qualified, motivated staff uh, members and board members, and they're passionate and you know, that everybody's looking to uh, achieve the same goals. Um, so we have clearly defined committees, you know, your basic committees, membership, education, finance, executive committee, and then ad hoc committees if we need to create something. But what's unique, what we did a couple of years ago, which has made things a lot better, is this time of year, we, we allocate our annual budget to each committee. So if a state park person, if the education coordinator for the state park need something and they need something for a school field trip in a week, they can go directly to the chair of our education department for the friends and ask for it. And that person has their own budget and has knowledge, working knowledge of what's happening in that situation and is able to, to immediately grant those, those requests or say no and then have the conversation why. Uh, but that's really helped us streamline and become a, a, a much more nimble, especially with everything happening with the pandemic. We, we essentially have leaderships at, at every level. Uh, you know, we have leadership at every level and we're trying to, to make uh, everybody work cross-functionally. Um, and, you know, that really is, is helpful because we have very clearly defined roles. So, you know, hopefully the director of the Nature Center, if they needed something to do with our store, would know to call the fundraising uh, lead. Or if it was about education, they would know the right person to talk to, and then they would they would be able to figure it out. And if if for some reason they didn't have the funding, they could always come back to the board and ask for more. And then I just put some core values. You know, trust is really important when you're working in two different organizations. One's private, one's public. You really have to trust that you're all there for the right reason, right? Everybody's there for the same goal. 
Um, even our mission statement, we all collaborated with uh, to come together on it. You have to respect the other person. You know, they're coming from a different background. And then probably most important is empathy. So if the friends have something they're very passionate about, you hope the state park is gonna empathize and understand where they're coming from and why. And we certainly try to do the same thing. We understand that you know, when you're working with the state, there's sometimes very clear things you can and can't do. And you have to empathize and understand what that person needs uh, and, and how to, well, be a better friend. And that's really our, our mission. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. I, uh, I really appreciate that aspect. I, I, I'm assuming that a lot of folks are thinking, what, you know, sort of like outside the box is a, a unique way of structuring their organization. Um, obviously, I want to, we'll touch on that maybe a little bit more and sort of try to drill down to some of those other strategies about that. Um, I would like to just also just take a moment. Um, I noticed uh, that we have a, another special guest with us tonight. Um, Andy Fife uh, from New York State Parks. He's the assess Assistant Deputy Commissioner. Uh, he works very closely with PTNY, a lot of our friends groups. Um, I know he is on with us and I was just thought I might ask if he had a, a couple of moments um, to just touch on a few things that he thinks are important that Matt, Carl and Joshua have mentioned. Um, I know this is a topic that is near and dear to his heart. Um, you know, making sure there's a positive uh, working relationship between friends groups and uh, state park staff. So Andy, do you have any words of wisdom or strategies or things that you'd like to sort of reinforce uh, with all of our participants today? Sure, thanks, Will. I don't, I don't think I have any more wisdom than, than, than the three panelists, but um, let me start by say, saying thanks to PTNY. Uh, you know, it's been, it's just been a real silver lining for me doing th these webinars and, and the regional friends meetings. Uh, if there was ever any silver lining this year, it's just been awesome. And I thank you to PTNY for, for putting these on. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't prepare. I, I was listening. I, I think I picked up on a few things. I'll, you know, Joshua mentioned um, social media, and obviously that's so key to building community uh, with parks. Um, what I would mention is there's a real way to exponentially grow it and leverage it. Uh, whenever you can, that's that's what I've seen is uh, to do that. And two ways to do it: one is PTNY is an umbrella um, for all for many of our wonderful statewide friends groups. And I when I see uh, social media, um, like for when for example, when Fillmore Glenn recently had a, a ceremony for the check, um, it, it grew exponentially because PTNY retweeted, re Facebooked it. Um, same thing on the parks end, right? Parks is, we literally have one social media coordinator across the state, um, uh, 3,200 employees. Um, she has like five screens in front of her. Um, but when she sees something really good, um, she'll retweet it. And, you know, we've gotten, you know, sometimes up to 100,000 uh, 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 views and likes. So, one point from Joshua, uh, one point from Carl I picked up on was just appreciation, right? Um, you know, I, I now oversee parks, friends groups, relationships. Before that, I was a, I was um, an at-large member of a friends group. Um, so I've seen it from both sides and appreciation is so key and any creative ways you can do that. I, I'm a big, big believer in food. So I know, I know, um, I know you all know when there's food at an event, it's key. Uh, so I wanted to underscore that. And then, uh, hi, Matt, it's good to see you. Uh, um, thanks for all you do at a minute, Anthony. Um, I think what Matt said was really uh, uh, the underlining key to all of this from, from Park's perspective is that it's a relationship that we're building here. So any friends group really needs to think about who is my contact or contacts and vice versa, right? So our, I've been working with our site managers, uh, historic site managers and, and park managers to think about what is the friends group goals this year? Um, and then the friends group should be thinking, you know, is my park manager, site manager, are they working off a master plan? What's their budget this year? It's really a relationship. So I think Matt said monthly meeting is key. Totally agree. Um, you know, I even think, think that, uh, you know, sharing the master plan, sharing the budget, sharing 
upcoming goals for the year. This is a relationship you're building. And that's it's just the key part to remember is to build that relationship and to use the empathy that Matt mentioned um, for me as the underlying all this. So I'll stop there. Thanks for the opportunity. Will, I really appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Andy, always appreciate it. And, you know, I think on behalf of all of the friends groups and, and our participants, it's always really nice to hear that the state is thinking the same way and both parties are working towards having a really positive and collaborative relationship, you know, and relationships have up and downs, um, but positive communication is key and that's how, and that's how it goes. So um, we're going to dive into that a little bit too. So, so thank you. Um, so Matt, Carl and Joshua, I have, some questions lined up for you. Um, I'm going to uh, attempt here to uh, frame them as best I can. Um, and I'll probably just sort of direct them to one of you, but certainly feel free um, other panelists to chime in as well and provide your, your two cents and uh, again, your insights here. So um, I'm actually gonna pick on a topic that we haven't quite touched on yet, um, but I know uh, certainly, Joshua, just from my experience at Fillmore Glen personally, and also Carl, you touched on just uh, very briefly here, is, is with your local officials in your town, in your community, um, you know, how do you engage with local leaders, your town boards, your mayors, um, and you know, how important is it for them to commit to your group, and how do you talk about what your group does? So. It's a broad topic, but you know, Joshua, maybe you'd be willing to start. Um, how do you how do you have that conversation with your local leaders? Sure. Um, well, I just go down to the mayor's office and say, "Hey, <laughs> no." Uh, but um, uh, you know, it's tough because we've reached out to local officials as well as a uh, little bit larger uh, officials, and it, so you know, sometimes it is very difficult to get them to come or or to get them to hear. Um, but you have to really be persistent. Um, like I went down to the village office and hand delivered the, the circus flyer for uh, the Fillmore days. I uh, talked to the mayor in person about it. Um, you know, it's, you have to be persistent. I think that is key when dealing uh, with any of those officials. Yeah, Will, we had the opportunity early into our committee work um, to become aware of a collaborative relationship that existed at the North End of Letchworth Park between three area villages, the village of Perry and in the Wyoming County, uh, Mount Morris and Geneseo in Livingston County, and uh, recognized immediately that they were working on a lot of the same kinds of things in their relationship to Letchworth Park, being a gateway to the park, as we were trying to build with being in the, in the development of gateways, trailheads, access points along the Greenway. And so what we developed was a close working relationship with that group and partnered with them in, in an application to become a part of what we call the Rural Economic Development Innovation Initiative, which was a program that USDA came out with, which fulfilled a lot of the same kinds of things we we're trying to do, get in front of other communities, promote this rural uh, recreation economy uh, as, as a stimulus towards uh, finding improvements and connectedness between the communities and our trail. And again, like I said, the, the trail's there in most part because, uh, and the communities there is because the canal and the history, history of what that all brought to be years and years ago. So building off of that was really our, and, and tying into that program really helped us a lot. Okay. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, um, you, if, folks, if you're not familiar with Zoom, if you go to the top right corner of your screen, you, screen, you can change the view. Um, just to encourage you to possibly be in gallery view. Linda added this to the chat. Uh, for everyone, but it's still a good way to sort of see everyone a little bit more easily if you prefer that view. So just want to put that out there. Thanks for a little bit of an easier conversation. Um, one other thing I want to talk about too, just sort of off Carl's last point is really about the partnerships um, and really sort of like in the broader nonprofit sphere, we're all sort of in a way competing for the same resources, particularly in smaller towns or in, in our villages and communities. How do you find your niche and, and, and speak about your niche to those partners and say, we're not competing, but we're actually working towards the same things. Cause it's a really nuanced and challenging thing sometimes to iron out. So I know it's a very specific question, but um, if any of our panelists, you know, Joshua, maybe you want to start, I saw you nodding your head. Um, you know, how do you sort of identify, we want to bring these partners in, but we're not competing for the same thing. We can work synergistically and get farther together. How do you, how do you do that? 
Well, that's a difficult thing because you don't want to feel like you're overpicking all your local businesses. Um, so for like I Love My Park Day, we reached a little bit outside of just our local community. Um, we went to some businesses in, in like Dryden to provide us with bagels. Um, but we definitely try and limit the amount of times per business we act. We ask uh, for things. Um, also, um, you know, we work a lot with the other non-for-profits in the area. We work with Boy Scouts. We work with Girl Scouts um, or H Club. And um, with like an event that we'll have, we'll each give them, let's say, a specific task. So for the car show that we hold every year and the um, Fillmore Days, uh, the Boy Scouts sell bottles of water. So that's their, their only job. They're the only people that do it there. Um, so each one of them kind of get their own specific piece of the pie um, where they can excel in that way. Not everybody's doing the same exact thing. Um, I'd say that's probably the best approach. Uh, try and work well with the other groups as well as, um, you know, give them their strengths. I mean, what they like doing or what they're good at doing, let them do it. <laughs> We provided uh, the space for an Easter egg hunt, uh, the kids running up and down the Greenway. And on the I Love My Park Day, uh, we tied into the local village doing an Arbor Day event. So while they were doing a tree planting, literally on the Greenway, adjacent to the Greenway, we were also uh, promoting cleanup and uh, it worked very well. That is wonderful. We've so, worked with uh, Wells College in the past with our invasive species at at uh, I Love My Park Day. So, you know, that's their type of thing. So we let them do that. <laughs> it's definitely key to cater their needs. And it's nice that you can uh, coordinate getting uh, multiple groups together like that. Great work, Carl. We, we definitely take the philosophy, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. And a few years ago, we had a large, well, to us, it was large capital campaign to redesign our nature center. And, you know, there was some wonder, we were, we're sort of competing for the same donors as the local land trust and with, there's a, an environmental organization locally called Save the River that was all working with the, with the similar donors. Uh, but what we, what we had to realize is that we could one, help each other uh, and two, um, we're all sort of have different missions, right? And there's, there's plenty to go around, especially if we work together. So, you, even though we were all com sort of somewhat competing, we're really not because there tends to be more dollars when we all work together. We all let each other know when we're gonna have our summer uh, fundraising event. And we make sure that we don't schedule things uh, to compete with each other. We do that not just for those two organizations, but all the local organizations that are fundraising. Everyone tries to communicate. You know, It's important to communicate internally, but then critically important to communicate uh, outside. And then we also work on things together, which makes it better because uh, with Save the River, they have uh, added to our field trip program where they'll take some of the kids out on a boat and then come to the nature center by boat. Um, with Tilt and Save the River, we now have an internship for a local student that they can spend two weeks with each organization, the state parks, the land trust, and this other organization. And by working together, we just had a meeting the other day, it really uh, has helped improve, you know, what's working for us, what's working for you. And we can share ideas and, and let each other know about different grants that, hey, maybe this won't work for us, but we, th we think this may fit into what you're trying to do over there with your mission. So it's definitely always good to over communicate. To, to, build, to build off of that real quick, uh, we recently worked together. Um, there's a group that's interested in the Genesee River. Obviously we're interested in the Greenway, we also have the Finger Lakes Trail and we have access to potentially grant funded sources that look for collaboration, look for um, regional focused uh, initiatives, uh, biggest bang for their buck, so to speak. So um, we're always on the, on, the, on the lookout for those kinds of partnerships and relationships. At first, they don't, maybe they don't work right away, but everyone gets the idea that this is working towards a greater good. Uh, and, and in the Western New York region, that seems to work very well for us. Okay, that's that's good information. I appreciate it. something that I think you're all essentially mentioning is that you have to kind of just put it out there, make the ask, and not only be willing to you know put out what you want, but listen and then reciprocate in kind and say, you know, we can do more together. And sometimes you have to give up maybe a little bit, but in the long run, you've gained that much more. And so, um, I, you know, I appreciate that. I saw that um, Andy, if we can. Uh, if uh, Shannon and Eric, if they built a new Andy, had one other comment you wanted to chime in on that topic. So uh, Andy, would you want to 
add to. Oh, I don't know if I'm unmuted. I, no, you're good. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to toot the horn of um, Friends of Spa Park, Saratoga Spa, who I think, I think Helene and Chip are on here. Um, you know, because my answer to the question is that the parks and DEC and the outdoor in industry is a growth industry, a huge growth industry. So I think there's enough to go around, right? So I'm going to give one of their examples a few years back. You know, they, they sat with the park in Saratoga, which has a lot of buildings and a lot of pavement that, that they need to keep going and a lot of bricks and mortar. And it became very clear that the park wasn't going to get around to um, renovating the historic mineral springs anytime soon. Um, so the friends took that on and it's been just awesome um, because they, they fixed one spring after the other. The park, it was 20 years out, you know, from them ever doing that. And uh, to Matt's point, you know, the local land trust might have been some of the same donors, but um, it was a specific site within the park. So everyone in town wanted those done. Um, so I thought that was just a key diversification. You know, where can you add value? And then, and then we'll get to the land trust land, you know, um, but I, I really think there's plenty to go around. So I just want to provide that example. Okay. Thank you. Andy. I appreciate it. Um, I want to get to some of the, the questions that are coming in from um, all of our participants. I had two more specific questions that I, I'm just, I'm, I have to go for, I'm just so curious. Um, Matt, one of the things that you, we talked about um, was the sort of internal structure and organization of your friends group. Um, and after we chatted with you, Shane and I, you know, counted afterwards, we're like, oh, this idea, this idea. And so it was very inspiring for us. Um, and I think sort of talking about your organic versus your top down structure can sound very scary, I would think, to some groups that are used to doing it in a more traditional fashion. Um, so basically a two-part question for you. You know, what tips would you have to those groups that think it's too scary to take on or to try something new? Um, and sort of maybe as an addition to that, for those groups that don't have more of an organizational backing, they truly are volunteer-driven, any tips on how they could do something similar to create that positive communication? Yeah, so for, for us, it, it, change can be definitely a little bit scary. And especially if you're dealing with, you know, comp if you're looking at the two organizations as separate entities, sorry about that. Um, but realistically, we're trying to look at it as if we're the same. And we're really, we really do benefit because we, we have really worked hard at finding board members and volunteers who come from different areas and have different skill sets. And to have that organic structure, it really depends on having the right people at both organizations. You have to have people who trust each other. You have to have people who are willing to communicate and then they're gonna follow through with what they say they're gonna do. It breaks down if people aren't all on the same, same page. And so, yeah, that, that can be tough, especially if you're, if you're the leader at the top and you're used to having things go your way, it can be difficult. But this way makes you, in my opinion, it makes you uh, able to change and able to keep up with change better. And uh, it really allows each person who's working for the organization to bring their own set of strengths. That there's people who work on our board that I don't have those strengths and I'd much rather tap into them and have them lead a certain area. Um, you know, everybody does communicate to the top. So if a parks person is gonna communicate, say the education corner uh, is gonna communicate with the friends, they're gonna copy in their boss. You know, cause we did have a little bit of issues there where they're trying to keep staffing in place, but then the friends may have an initiative they need some help with. Well, you have to make sure that you copy in the, the, the upper person so that you can keep track of where the person is. You know, if someone's knocking on doors or dropping off flyers or doing something like that, the, the boss has to know. So some of those things work themselves out. And as you know, there's been little issues over the time, but as long as you're honest and you uh, communicate, you work through it. Okay. And that is a, a good segue to my last question. Then we're going to open it up, I promise. But you touched on something that I feel like is sort of at the heart of this. And you've all talked about essentially developing a positive relationship with your park manager, the staff who are right there on site with you. And, you know, I think there are a lot of things you've mentioned, inviting them to board meetings, keeping them involved with email, or even possibly texting them if they're comfortable with that. Um, but park managers change volunteers and folks within the friends groups change. 
Um, what are some strategies you all have for, you know, maintaining that continuity of a positive relationship over a longer period of time? Um, and where it can't just be anchored in, you know, Carl's relationship with one park manager or, or Josh's relationship with one park. How do you keep that going? Um, Matt, you want to take that and then uh, feel free Josh and Carl to chime in. Sure. Uh, so we did have a new director come about a year, year and a half ago. And it, it is kind of tricky because you've built up a relationship with one person. You've, you've come up with a program that works for the two organizations. And then you get a new person in, you don't know exactly how they're going to take it. Uh, it's also difficult with a new person coming to a new area to learn the job, learn the people, learn everything they need to do. So, you know, when, when we onboarded a new director, one of the things we tried to do as friends is not over, overwhelm her. You know, we, instead of having our board meeting at the nature center, we had the board board meeting at my place. So it was, you know, more of a family feel, right? We wanted to welcome her and, and uh, you know, show that we're, we're not just stiff, you know? Um, but then we also tried to give her the leeway to learn her job and not step on her toes. And I think I said this before, you know, you get a new job, it's like drinking from a fire hose. You're just trying to take in so much and figure out what is happening. Uh, and we were just trying to, to make that process as easy as possible. And luckily with our budget system and the way that we operate, we're able to do that very well because we have a lot of different people leading a lot of different things, which takes the pressure off that person. So uh, that, that's, that's what worked for us. Well, I'll set the friends of Fillmore Glen haven't really had to deal with a, a change in management at the park at all. Um, we deal with uh, quite a few different personnel at the park. We have a pretty good re working relationship with uh, the assistants as well as all the employees there. Um, but I think if we had a new a park manager take on the position, we would um, ask them what their goals are or what their needs are. Because after all, we are there to help them and uh, to make it easier for them. So I guess we would approach it by having them come to our meeting and um, sitting down and just having us know what their goal is, what their end game, what they would like out of the uh, parks arrangement. And for us, the Greenway uh, started out as a DEC owned property. So it was a transition from the DEC uh, organization over to uh, state parks. Um, our, our park manager is, you know, has to cover the 90 miles facility, you know, all by herself in her, in her small truck, right? So uh, she's all over the place and has to be very connected to all of us uh, in, in all of the communities and has a lot of good relationships with each of the municipalities. Um, thank you, uh, you know, Joshua, Carl, and that really appreciate it. Thank you, Andy, also for uh, your thoughts on that. Shane, I know we have some questions, so I'm going to step back and let you take take the lead. Let us know, um, you know, what some folks are interested in learning more about. Of course. Thank you, Will. Uh, thanks for facilitating that conversation and to our panelists, uh, some great insight. And I, I know we're eager to get to what our audience is asking. Um, I've had quite a few questions directed at me directly, so... Um, be patient while I get to those. Uh, if you do have a question now, great time to ask. Uh, we can still get to them. And then, uh, yeah, let's get started. So our first question, I know we talked a bit about changing management. Maybe some hasn't changed. We talked about how to facilitate positive relationships, but every relationship has conflict, right? Um, and partners can create barriers or push back on your initiatives. Um, how, how do you manage that? And send that over to Will so he can direct it. Yeah, I mean, it seems like every relationship comes with challenges, right? It's not all rosy all the time. Um, and it's just part of adult life, right? <laughs> Everyday life. Um, I don't know. Let's, uh, let's see. Matt, are you, do you want to, you're unmuted. So um, <laughs> right off the rip, see my screen. You know, how do you do that? How do you overcome when state park staff pushes back on something that you really want to champion? Uh, first of all, I just try to really listen. So try to understand where they're coming from, uh, try to empathize, you know, understand uh, what could be the reason why they feel this way. Um, sometimes it's just a, a top down thing. You know, it is what it is. And once you understand that, it, it, you know, you, you get by it. Sometimes it's because there's some other resource that may be, uh, you know, needing different resources or, or different time spent. Um, but I, we have an agreement, the, the Nature Center uh, director and myself and the leadership team, we're trying to be as honest as possible. So you, you have a difficult conversation. You've had a conversation with an employee or someone who maybe has said something that's difficult. You just try to be open and honest 
and then listen and be understanding uh, when they come back to you. And I have found when people don't say the whole truth or they don't see what's on, what's on their mind, then it usually takes a turn south. And as long as you can be open and upfront, it just seems like the communication um, will stay open and you can get by it and move on. Joshua, you're nodding. So I don't know if you wanna. <laughs> <laughs> I would say just don't get discouraged. Um, I've had some what I thought were great ideas and I proposed them to the park manager and mm -hmm. he said, well, how about we do this instead? And you know what? That's okay. Um, you know, you, you, you feel a little hurt about it, but, um, you know, what? uh, the next year later, I proposed that same idea and we did it. So, I mean, like you said, it might not just be the right timing. There might be other reasons for it. Um, just don't get discouraged and, uh, you know, keep trying. <laughs> in, in our um, meetings, in our meetings, we hear a lot of the different activities and there's a lot of diversity in what activities are that we're doing. Um, and I always kind of link back to the forming, storming, norming. Um, performing and each one is in some stage of that process of that sequence and so stepping back and going you know what this is something that's totally new to this organization or is it totally new to this municipality and and kind of everyone's at a different stage of, of their background and understanding related to that so that's really helpful to me and Carl you said something last time when we spoke too which stuck with me which is you know your people are really passionate if they're giving their time you know, if they're, if they're working 50 hours a week for their job, 60 hours a week for their job, and then they're coming and they're working on their nights and their weekends, these are passionate group of people. And, you know, passions can definitely turn either way, positive or negative. And um, I think the important thing, too, is just to make sure when you're communicating, you have the same goal in mind. So for us, we use our budget, but we make sure that we have our mission statement clear and that we know why we're there. We're there to educate people and get them to love the outdoors. And as long as we can both maintain that we're there for the same and the right reason, then essentially these things work out. I think that's great advice from all of you. I appreciate it. Um, something that the park team has been talking about, just the art of compromise. You know, you all get along if you give up a little bit of something and ultimately doing a little bit of something is better than not doing anything. So, uh, but Joshua, I think it's a good advice just to stick with it and, and keep trying and coming out in a different way. So Shana, what else, uh, what else are our folks curious to learn? So I have a question here from Elizabeth Watson uh, asking, how do you maintain continuity in keeping partners engaged in large scale projects that take a while to complete? It's a good question. Good, great question. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> I think, I think the best idea is to distribute the work. Um, I have probably a bad habit of trying to take on everything myself. And my mom, who is on this call, uh, helps keep me in line, really. Uh, I mean, she does. She's been doing it my whole life. She's great at it. Um, but yeah, you have to distribute the workload among your people. Make sure they understand uh, what their role is in this. And then don't micromanage them. Let them figure it out. And then just kind of keep tabs, you know, light tabs on them um, just to say, hey, how's things going? And um, that's probably my two cents on that. <laughs> And we have members that are, you know, 30 years at this and, and they've, you know, given their, their life you know, to this facility and the dream of getting this, you know, to where it is today. And there's going to be another 30 years worth of work going forward. And so uh, being able to, uh, to build the uh, capacity uh, and leverage other resources that are at your disposal or within close contact relationships you develop over time uh, are, are especially important. When we have a, a long project when we had our capital campaign and our redesign, uh, definitely the things you guys are talking about is critically important. And then just like some smaller tactics, we tried to take, have you ever heard of SMART goals? So that's something that we were trying to do, you know, sizable, measurable actions, you know, time specific. One of the biggest issues we were running into as a board is we weren't assigning times or deadlines. And so we've even had our secretary build that into our monthly notes where we say, okay, we'll come up, we'll vote on something, we'll, we'll say we're going to do something. And then He's really great because he's, well, wait a minute, what are we going to do this by? And so having clear deadlines has been critically important, meeting those deadlines. And even if you don't have done what it is you want to get done, letting the team know what the status is, because that's one of the things, deadlines sometimes get missed, it's going to happen. But um, 
communicating where you are in the process at that point is critically important because it brings it up to the forefront. And what we see all the time, maybe you guys are the same, but because we have the monthly board meeting, you see this flurry of emails right before the meeting, like three, four days before where everybody's working like, oh no, I can't believe the board meeting's coming. And then that week after, right? And you get those, those golden periods where people are really rocking. So, um, you know, those are just some little things that we've done. Hopefully that helps. So one of the things I've mentioned that on that topic too, that all three of our panelists have mentioned, as well as a connection to our last conversation uh, last week that Lyndon has really been stressing and I've learned from her is just more personal touches too. You know, just to kind of reach out to folks one-on-one, -on -one, a quick message or even a text if that is what works for your, you know, that relationship and say, hey, thanks for sticking with us. You know, here's this update, you know, Matt, to your point. And um, I think that that's gone a long way for some of our work. So for what, for what that's worth. But uh, enough from me, Shana, back to you. What other questions do we have? <laughs> well, I know we're nearing the end here. Uh, it's almost, it's approaching five pretty quickly. We mm -hmm. want a minute or two for some closing remarks, but I have about one or two left. We'll see what we can get to. Um, but this question is more related to COVID. And I know we talked about events um, and how your groups have handled those, how you've reached out community, but we, we've seen that engaging with your community is a lot different right now, right? It's a different time. So have you found any unique insights into engaging with your community due to COVID? Um, have you seen anything that has actually helped you better engage with your community, being creative, stepping out of the box, like we've talked about at all our past webinars here? Yeah, one, one of the great traditions of our group is the uh, potluck dinner that we do for our annual meeting. And that was quite disappointing. Food is really, really important. And uh, we didn't do that, but we did a Zoom session uh, to, to get everyone together uh, remotely. And it worked out really good because we could actually show pictures and do the kinds of interaction that we otherwise wouldn't with the entire membership. So that was really good. We're leaning heavily on our social media. Uh, you know, even if people can't visit us, you know, we get visitors from all over the country. So if they can't come or Canada, you know, which the border's closed right now. So we've been trying to really get photographs of the nature center, photographs of the, the river, sunsets. If they can't be with us in person, then we want to get them there in spirit. Mm -hmm. And then we've tried to have a, a weekly email blast just saying, here's the things happening at the nature center. And then maybe an ask something that we were spotlighting in the store or uh, our membership platform. And then, um, you know, our, our newsletter, we've, we've really put a lot of time into our newsletter. And so we're trying to make sure we get that to people because it's a great way for us to communicate. Yeah, things are different, but we're going to come out of this thing stronger and we're going to come out with, with resources like Zoom, which we weren't using before, which has definitely made us a better, stronger organization. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Yeah, I think that's important. Uh, social media, electronic communication. Um, that's what has worked for us. I mean, we, we leave uh, pamphlets and whatnot at the flyer and, or in the park at common areas, but um, the online presence is really what helps during this time. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, panelists. That's all we have for our q and um, I'll switch over. I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us, all our attendees, everyone who's come to all these events or just this one, thank you so much. Uh, panelists, thank you so much for your insight. Uh, we hope you found this conversation informative and inspiring, and we would love to hear from you and see you at a future event. Remember, keep your eyes peeled for some more programming from PTNY, and check your inbox in the upcoming days for a follow-up email from us with a survey about today's conversation and also some resources that we talked about. Um, we will include contact information for the panelists today if you do have a specific question and want to reach out to them. Um, or you can email someone on the PTNY team and we would be happy to connect you. If you are interested in learning more about this topic or other topics pertinent to friends groups, we strongly encourage you to check out our website, uh, ptny.org. We have a friends resource kit and a best practices manual specifically for friends groups. Um, those resources should help you get started. Uh, and finally, please stay in touch. We can't emphasize that enough. Uh, we are here for you. We want to help. We want to learn more from you. We're really excited to work with friends in this manner. Uh, follow us on social media. If you aren't already, our contacts are on the screen. Um, and then if you are a group associated with New York State Parks, consider joining our Facebook friend group. It's a great way to get involved with other friends, keep the conversation going. Uh, and with that, thank you again. We wish you a festive holiday season. 
Have a good rest of your evening and please be safe in that snow. Thank you.